All right, so I'm calling this presentation. Now, this is my second presentation, by the way. I did one, I think it was 2018, on the uh, Tucker radio that I restored on a car that actually went out to, to, to the, the, what was the name of the car show? I forget the name of it. Um, what was the name of that car show? Pebble, Pebble Beach car show. It was a high-end car show. And uh, the radio that uh, I restored that went to the Tucker that was just had a special judging and the car came in second place due to some politics and some shady things going on over there. But that's a, another story for another time. So I'm just calling tonight's presentation. Everything you want didn't know about plastics and using antique radios, but never gave it a second thought. Because I never, I mean, I spent, I was a couple months short of 30 years in the plastics industry. I never gave it a second thought until Rich said, well, you know, why don't you do this? And uh, I agreed to do this. And originally what was supposed to happen was Harry and, Ray, we're going to do a presentation, but due to scheduling things or whatever, we switched dates. So I decided to do this today instead of uh, September. So, um, hey, hey, Bob, yes. What year is it? Yeah, I know. I have the wrong date up there. We're, we're one year uh, too far, so let me move over to the uh, next slide. This is, this is what we were just talking about. This is kind of a low-resolution uh, JPEG of a scene from the movie, but... Ultimately, he's saying to the guy, this is where you want to go. You want to be in plastics. All right, plastics is going to be the future. Plastics is going to be everything. That's where you want to go. Because if you really, if you ever watch this movie, Dustin Hoffman is just trying to find himself. He's trying to figure out what he wants in life, what he wants to do with himself. And here's this guy just giving him advice. Well, that, that never went down for me. I was just basically a kid struggling just to come up with some money to go to a local county college. And uh, I had to find a job doing something. So I, I started working for the Mattel toy company. Yes, Mattel. Mattel that had Barbie. And of course, Barbie is a great movie. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen it. It's made over a billion dollars already, right? Barbie. You had Hot Wheels. Remember the Hot Wheels cars? I mean, most of you guys remember them when you were kids, right? They even had, uh, now this is electronics, but do you remember the video game system called Intellivision? Well, when I was working at Mattel, we molded the cases for the Intellivision. They were made from brown, what they call brown ABS plastic. And uh, we even had a, a hot stamping machine that put Lee press on wood on either side to give it that nice little wood trim finish on the plastic and everything. So I worked there for about a year, became a supervisor, and I learned a lot about life and a lot about machinery in a very short period of time. It was hard work, but it was fun. So let me uh, get into this. Now, as I break this down, I'm going to talk about two different things. The, the thing I'm going to focus on are just the basic plastics that are going into radio cases. Toward the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the machinery that made the radio cases. So this is kind of be, going to be like a two-part presentation. So first, let me just start talking about the plastics uh, itself here. Now, there are two, now I'm not a polymer chemist, so I'm not one that's going to tell you everything and how polymer chains link in the scientific end of the things, because that wasn't what I did. But there are two main different plastics. There's, let me get to the next one, there's thermoset resins or plastics and thermoplastics. Thermoset plastics uses a chemical reaction under heat to do the polymer linking or the bonding of the plastic. There's also, a, a, I didn't put that in here, but there's also some formaldehyde, which made it not so nice to be around and sniff and smell and breathe it in. That wasn't really a healthy thing, but back then I don't think there was any, no one probably even cared about that. Thermoplastic, however, it can just be melted, and then as the plastic gets melted in a barrel or whatever and gets mixed. It just does the chemical bonding through heat, but didn't need any chemicals to make that bonding. Okay, so another, that's the, one of the differences. The other difference is that thermoset plastics, once it's been heated and molded, you can't use it again. Thermoplastic resins, however, can be melted, reground, and then used over and over and over and over again. Okay, so those are the two main types of plastics, and then it just kind of goes on from here. 
So let me get into the actual plastics going into radios. Okay, now, as most of you know, there's radios made from Bakelite. Bakelite is a thermoset type of plastic, a thermoset resin. Most often used colors were brown and black. The brown radios typically had a little bit of mottling in it, and mottling means that they had a little bit of a swirl patterns and things in there. So when you buff them out or after they were molded, first molded, they, you could actually see a little bit of swirling in there, and that's because it was, the, the way it was made. And I'll talk about that at the end. Black radios were painted, all right? But they also, radios can be molded in bracket, bright, attractive colors as well, which I'll get into a little bit later on with the other types of plastics. So, plastics was basically an alternative to buying a wooden radio for obvious reasons. It's the economics of it. It was cheaper for the radio manufacturers to make plastic cabinets than to make wooden cabinets. Wooden cabinets required more labor, required more steps to make it look nice. You know, there was finishing and then varnish and all that. Once this guy was molded, all you had to do was trim the excess plastic off these things, and then you throw your radio cabinet in there, you were done. All right, so that's, that was just the economic, economic alternative. Now, Big Light was invented by this cat right here. And uh, what was his name? I forget. Leo Bakeland. Big, Big Land? I thought I had this up here somewhere. Leo Bakeland. He had the patent for this in 1906. But he also took out 400 more patents to the manufacturing and the applications of Bakelite. So one of those came with this. He started a semi-commercial production in his laboratory in 1910 when daily output had reached 180 liters, and most of it was used for electrical insulators. I think he had a contract at one time with, uh, with Westinghouse, I, I believe. I, I was trying to do some of the research on here. He formed a U.S. company to manufacture and market this new industrial material, and by 1930, the Bakelite Corporation occupied a 128-acre plant in Boundbrook. And I actually know where that is. It used to be, it actually, after, it just, you know, goes round and round. But Bakelite, the patent was actually bought out by the next slide. You'll see um, it was in a plant, a Union Carbide plant in Boundbrook. There was this huge plant. And ironically, as part of my experience in being in plastics, I worked for a, it sounds like the name of a punk rock band, but structural foam molder, okay? And it's a different type of molding, injection molding. And they were, it was founded by three members. of They were basically retirees from Union Carbide. John, did you have a question? Just, I'm, I'm, this is half in jest, but not entirely. Is that a super fun site today? You know, ironically, that some of these places have turned to Superfund f sites. So, <laughs> so it's, that, that's, that's, yes? I'm not surprised. It's been a long time, but I remember, I don't know where I saw it. I think it, for some reason I'm thinking it was near Highland Park, but maybe it was Boundbrook. There was still a plant standing that had a big smokestack, the Union Carbide, and it said Bakelite on the smokestack. Mm -hmm. Still, yeah. Oh, yeah. years ago, I don't remember now. Long time, yeah. yeah. New Jersey, I noticed for a fact that New Jersey is the number one state out of the 50 states that have Superfund sites. We have more Superfund sites doing cleanups of a lot of these places well, we than any other state. Cornell Dublier. Cornell Dublier was a big one, yeah. So Rich, actually Rich Scoba told me all about that and the history about that, so that was just uh, crazy. So this is the guy that was responsible for, for all these... Uh, Bakelite things, and it just it goes beyond radio cabinets too. By the way, before I get to, I don't want to. Uh, well, we're still on the subject of Bakelite. If you look at these two radios right here, now this is this is a Stromberg Carlson radio that, ironically, I picked up at JD Auctions for two dollars and fifty cents. I restored everything, okay. And this is an RCA from the late forties as well. Now this is natural Bakelite, and this is black. Why were most painted uh, radios, black Bakelite. Well, it was easier to make a mix of black resin and more, it was cheaper than the brown because sometimes 
you would get floor sweepings and stuff for this, and they would reuse it and put it in the black because you couldn't see it anyway because they paint the case. So it was actually cheaper. For, I found this out. It was actually cheaper for the manufacturers to make that black cabinet and paint it than to have this. Who knew? I was just really weird. I was. I that would found that out in my research. All right. So as we move around along, Catlin. Now I don't have a Catlin radio, and thank thanks to John Buzz Fasina for bringing in this nice Emerson Catlin radio. And I I was fooled by it. I thought it was Plascon, but it is a Catlin radio because as, as I looked at it closer. Now it's dirty, but you could actually see there's some green mottling in the black and that's really cool but then as i look at it, there is a crack here on the side and I, as i was looking at it, the way it was molded it would make sense and catlin had these kind of problems you know if you have a catlin in your collection if you have a perfect catlin you're one of the few because the the, the, the catlin and the plascon which i'm going to talk about next seem to have those problems with cra cracking uh, delaminations and, and, and things like that. So, uh, also, you got to remember too that um, the types of molding equipment and machinery, I'm not going to get into the technical ends of that net yet, but they were primitive compared to what they have now. So, as, as a result, we, we can mold a, a Catlin cabinet today, it would be perfect. Because. That's just the name of the plastic. That's what, they, that's what it was called. So it was actually developed by this, this guy, Fritz Pollock, and he was just another chemical engineer from Vienna. And he uh, worked with this other guy, Dr. Kurt Ripper, who was another Austrian chemist, and they teamed up. And they, and they ended up buying uh, Bakelite from uh, Bakeland in, in 1927 because they let the, the patents expire. So it's still a thermoset resin, this. But that, that's part of the reason why, you know, the plastic is, is so good, even though it was pretty to look at and everything. But it was still cheaper than a wooden radio back then. I mean, back, back, back when that radio was made, nobody had a clue. You, you could buy this radio for probably two-thirds of the price of a wooden radio. Who knew that they would be this kind of money now? That's why I own a Catlin. I'd, I'd be afraid to own one because, especially with two cats in the house, I'll just fall over and... You know how cats are always checking gravity, you know? Lock the knot and knock stuff off the walls and everything. So I, with two cats around, there's no way I'm going to have a catlin on the shelf in my house. And I love my cats, don't get me wrong, but, you know. What's so. The I don't know the chemical specifics, but there, there is a difference. It, it, well, as far as the, the usability of it goes, Fred, it, it's, it's like the... The Bakelite ones like this, the full-blown Bakelites, the, this and the painted one on the end, they're actually easier to work with. The Catlin had, I think, a little more something to give it a better shine and to give it a little more uh, translucentness, if that makes sense, to make it, you know, it was just basically a, a, a way to try to make it look nicer, you know. And then the next, the next thing here is the Plascon. Come on. Oh, this worked before. Hold on a second. Maybe it's, I don't like my left hand. Maybe I use my right. Yeah, it's my right hand it likes. It doesn't like my left hand. All right, so Plascon, which is like this white Emerson right here. Very nice and very attractive. But Plascon has its limits too. Now, it started, it's a trade name for a urea molded plastic made by the Libby Owens Ford Glass Company of Toledo. Now, of course, everything that you see on this, table is a thermoset. There's only one plastic we're going to talk about that's not a thermoset. It's a thermoplastic, but I'll be next. Now, the, the cool thing about Plascon is, and actually, I think it looks better. It can be molded in, in, in different colors and finishes, but the problem is the cases were usually prone to stress cracking, injection mold venting, and injection mold venting was, was necessary to basically the, the, minimize that kind of problem. It would take away, uh, the venting is, let me explain what venting is first before I get too far ahead of myself. When you injection mold anything, you have two mold halves, okay? Where the mold comes together in the machine before it's injected, the part there where, where the halves meet together, they call that a parting line, okay? 
Along the parting line, modern molds, today's molds, have these little channels that are cut on the edges. And they're only a few thousandths of an inch. And what they are are vents. Because when you're actually putting in plastic into the mold, okay, when you close the mold, you've basically, you've just got a void, all right, between the mold halves. So when that plastic's going in the mold, that air needs to go somewhere, all right? And if you want to inject it fast, it's imperative that you have that venting there to allow that air to get out so that plastic can get in and, and fill the void between the mold halves. Does that make sense? So a lot of the earlier molds didn't have any venting at all or just minimal venting, and then that created problems for the part itself. So then, like, like on this Catalan radio right here, if the, if the mold had adequate venting, on this, this crack, which is actually following uh, where I guess the, the plastic came together in the mold. If it had better venting in here, this crack may not have happened. Okay, that's just speculative on my part. Okay. So plastic again, another thermoset. But they, they can make, it, make, it make that in colors, but most of the Plascon radios were white. Okay. So let me move on now. There is one more plastic I want to talk about before we get to the uh, thermoplastic resin, and these are the beetle cabinets. Okay, now, in my mind, I have a very demented mind sometimes. I think strange thoughts, but when I looked at that, I thought that these were, the, way, the way these were sold, these were the MyPillow marketing of plastic radios because they would try to market these things with a modeling. So this is basically a Plascon radio, but they put a lot of different colors. There's a little green up here. There's like an orange here. And that's just to really give it a really kind of a pretty look. But it, they were really, really hard to mold. And it was more, as I have here, they were modeled or marble with a white base, most of them anyway. And some manufacturers, this was the my pillow part, sold these as the onyx option. So. That was maybe a way they can squeeze a, you know, another dollar out of radio or wherever they were selling it at the, uh, the store or whatever. I'm sorry, Bob, how did the like, different colors get involved in it? Well, the different colors gets involved where, I'll get to that when we get to the, the machinery end, and I'll explain that. Okay? So that's, that's, the, that's the Beetle radio. And then next, good old polystyrene the first thermoplastic resin used in radios. Okay, now a lot of the plastics we use today, uh, we have polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene, and it just goes on from there There's ABS, and then you can get into uh, some of the more, they have engineered resins. They have resins, plastic resins, that run over 600 degrees. Um, uh, you guys have probably heard on the news about the Takata airbags. You know, there was big recall on all that stuff. Well, when I worked for a Japanese machine tool company, I worked with a company, I don't want to name the name of the company, but I worked with this company here in New Jersey that had a vertical molding machine. So in other words, most machines are horizontal clamping like this, all right? They had one of my company's vertical machines and the mold opens this way. Then what would happen is you had these two rollers and every time a part was molded, it would actually insert, they had a robotic thing that would insert a piece of steel into the mold. The mold would close and then Ultem, this 630 degree or 640 degree super engineered resin would mold on top of it. And that was the base for a Takata airbag when it was in development. This is long time ago. This is like 19, 1994 or five, I think. And, they, and Honda, they were working directly with Honda cars. I think that was the first car to receive them. So um, polystyrene went into radios probably from eh, probably the early 50s on, depending on the manufacturer. They were much, much better. They looked nice. They were easier to mold. The plastic mold technology and the machine technology has gotten a little bit better by then. And then also... Um, they, it wasn't without some problems, though, because the finishes, as you well know, if you have, like, say, an AA5 radio from God only knows where, 
you could easily scratch that cabinet. Okay, so that wasn't, you know, that was, that was a problem. Except uh, the other thing was, although it was more durable than previously used plastics and radio cabinets, um, do you remember, I think, Dave, didn't we have that on the website at one time? I know we had the, the RCA Victor guy sitting in the thing with the antenna, but didn't we have the impact uh, commercial as well, the IMPAC, where they had the cabinet, and the guy drops it on the floor, look, this won't break, and he holds the radio up here like this, and he drops it, boom, and falls on the floor, and it's just on bounces, on, it's on YouTube, on some, I thought we had it on our website, but maybe we don't, they called it Impact, I-M-P-A-C, Nello's bobbing his head, yes, yes you remember that, RCA and only RCA had that, that's right. But what made that plastic harder or a little bit more durable than the other ones that other, other companies were using? They had more rubber in that mix. So you could actually, in, you know, you can import or put in things to kind of make things more rugged or you could change the color. By then you could do anything. You know, this stuff was pre-colored. This was pre-colored. This was pre-colored. This was pre-colored. By the time you got the thermoplastics, you could do anything you want with colors. The technology, the molding technology and the plastic was so much more better. So, so anyhow, now let me go into the next part of this, how it's made. There used to be a TV show like that, so I figured I'd just carry this over to that. All right, so how are these things made? Well, they were made using hard. Now, this is my wheelhouse. I'm not a polymer chemist, all right. But this is the stuff that I could do now. And I actually, I actually worked with one of Mike's uh, graduate students back in 2018, here, Professor Mike. And we actually made these. Here, let me show you. I worked with his graduate student, and ultimately we ended up making these cool little coasters with the Princeton University logo on it. You can pass that around. I want that back though, because that's the only one I got. <laughs> So I taught, I taught the students, to, actually there was more than one, but then there was people that worked in, uh, that's in that building over there, the engineering building, that's around the block from here. And uh, we made that, and I taught them how to use the machine. Mike had a very small machine. We, we did that together a couple, took us like two days to get it all going. So most machines are horizontal. The clamp is this way. The rate for size depending on the mold clamping force in tons. So when the mold closes up, there's usually a, a, a force that's measured in tonnage to keep the mold closed. So smaller machines, smaller molds, smaller clamp force. Bigger machines, like these guys here, probably, if I had a venture or guess, like this Emerson, which is relatively small, I, you, you could probably do this in a one-cavity, 100-ton machine. The biggest radio here is the Stromberg Carlson uh, 1100H. That would be, I would say, a 250, 300-ton force machine. I have personally worked with machines as big as 1,500 tons. 1,500-ton machine would be probably as long as the fat part of this room and maybe about 12 foot high. And you'd be probably molding car bumpers or dashboards or whatever. And then they have molds that are one up, two up, where you can have multiple cabinets in one mold. All right, so they have one up, two up, four up, eight up, usually it goes like that. Okay. Radio company, well, these, like I said, 200 tons and up depending on part size, so that pretty much explains that. Okay. Now, this is kind of a, I found this on the web, this is kind of a rude looking cutaway of an injection molding machine, all right? So let me just read it as it shows it up here. Injection molding machines involves two distinct processes. The first comp uh, compromise the elementary steps of solids, transport, melt generation, mixing, and pressurization and flow. All right, so, all right, let me just skip over this because this is good, starting talking like an engineer. I want to keep it simple. Here, I've got a, uh, I've got my cat's laser pointer here. Like we do, we do this and the cat chases around. Oh, you know, if I had this up here, we'd burn up here before you. We chase this light around. All right, so let's let's start from the the front here and we'll work back. So this is your clamp cylinder. They have these tie rods and then we have two platens. You have a moving platen and a stationary platen. This is where you would mount the mold, the injection mold. Okay, 
the injection side of the machine, we have a barrel here. Inside this is a feed screw. We have a feed hopper. And then you have a motor which drives the screw. When you're trying to pick up material, the screw rotates. And as the screw rotates, it's actually traveling backward. It's going this way as the screw fills up with plastic. Once it reaches the desired rate or the amount of shot you want to put into the mold, that'll stop. The mold closes, and then this guy now goes forward and injects the plastic into the mold. All right. Now, what you don't see up here, and I couldn't find a good reference on the web anywhere, is when these were made, okay, Basically, your injection on the front of here, there would be a what they call a screw tip on the front. All right. What they used to use years and years ago was just a torpedo. So it would just look like a, it would be flat and then it would come down to a point. It was one piece and it would just attach to the front of the screw right here. Okay. So as the plastic would come into the screw, this thing would screw back push the material forward and get ready for the next shot, and then that torpedo would just plunge the material into the mold. And it worked, but it was also kind of sloppy. You would get, like, like flash all over the place, you know, like, like flashes, the plastic definition for excess material along the edge, okay? Now, I haven't been in plastics for probably 12, 13 years, but I found something in Costco now, this is a different type of molding, I know, but this is a piece of flash. And this came from a one-gallon poly, polyethylene milk, milk jug. And that goes between the handle and the jug itself. I knew what it was. Oh, so I just picked it up off the floor, and I figured, oh, this will be great for the presentation. But that's, that's a different type of molding. That's blow molding. This is injection molding. I'm not even going to try to explain blow molding because it gets, gets a little weird compared to this. You talk about shot. Now, is that the... The, the shot, is, when I say the word shot, the shot is the amount of plastic that you're dialing up here to shoot into the mold. Right, but you got the feed hopper. What's going into it? You say the shot. Well, you could either have plastic powder or plastic pellets. Okay. So the actual plastic... I'm sorry, I didn't say that, but that's the plastic mix would go into here and then feed that screw as... After the part is molded, here, let me, I'll, let me skip over one second. I'll show you, and then we'll come back to this. Still don't like my left hand. No, he likes my right hand. There we go. Okay. So this is what a molding cycle would look like. All right. I get my cat toy. All right. So one, this is just a, for instance, but let's say we're using crystalline material or plascon. It doesn't matter. All right, it's going to take 60 seconds in this example to make one part. All right, so you're injecting the material into the mold. All right, and in this case, it's 20 seconds. All right, after this is done, then you have what they call mold close time or cooling time, which in this case is 35 seconds. Then the mold opens up, and then you have five seconds. It's, that's long for an ejection, but... The part will eject off the core and then probably fall down in a chute because they didn't have robots or any kind of that kind of stuff until late 60s at the earliest. Nowadays, they have machines where they have robotics that would blow you away. I mean, you probably see maybe on a, on a television show where they're making cars and you see these big robots coming in and they're pulling the bumper around and slapping to the front of the car. And then you see two people run over and put sheet metal screws into something to put the bumper on the car. Well, nowadays we have robots that basically take the part out of the mold. So this injection time would probably be less than a second by the time you get that part and take the part out from the thing with the robot. So screw ram travel um, is basically, what do I mean by that? That's kind of, I don't understand that. That's just their terminology. Over here, let me just skip over this. Over here, you have your injection go, going into the mold. This is the 20-second portion of this. Um, typically, most machines have three pressures, the injected material in the mold. 
All right, and, there's, and unfortunately, there's a lot of different terminologies for this. Sometimes they call it fill pack dwell, uh, boost pack hold. I've heard it first, second, third pressure. Okay, mold fill is basically trying to get, like I was explaining about the mold venting, you're trying to get that air out from the mold. You're putting it into the mold and changing it from air to plastic. That's the fill part. The packing is once you get that void probably 95% or better filled into the mold, now you have to pack it in there to get the shape of the part. Like if you noticed at Stromberg Carlson, there's actually some rib work up here. So you need to pack that plastic into the mold to get good rib work up here. All right. And then once you're done with all that, you want to dwell or they call it dwell or hold until that plastic is cool enough that you could probably stop putting pressure on it and then just let it do some natural cooling within the mold itself. All right. Now down here, they have screw ram travel and ram free travel. I think that goes part of it with the cooling. I, I, I don't understand what they mean by this here, but during the cooling, after this injection is done, the screw starts spinning backward to collect the next shot. It's not just sitting there, okay, what do I do next? No, it's turning and getting material for the next shot. Then once it's done, parts ejected, all right, and then closes up again and starts making the next part. What about so, the shrink Well, you know, that's a great question, Fred, because shrink, there, did you know, now it's showing that, that there's gonna be some shrinkage here. Most of the shrinkage is gonna happen on that part while it's still in the mold. But most plastics, irregardless of who made the plastic or what type of plastic it is, most of the shrinkage that occurs, and it doesn't matter what type of molding, what type of plastic, most of the shrinkage occurs 48 hours after the part is molded. So that's still shrinking. When this part comes out of the mold, it's not you know, ice cold and you know, ready to you know, throw it on the production line and throw a radio in it. No, it's got to sit and shrink and then after the shrinkage is done after two, of a couple days then they they probably put the guts in here in the interim they're just taking these things and stacking them somewhere to give them that time to cool down How much shrinkage is there usually? it depends on the type of plastics used i'm not going to really get into that because i don't have the data with me but it, it depends on the type of plastic some plastics shrink more than others but the actual amount that it shrinks, you're only talking, you know, depending on the size and the thickness of the mold, it could be anywhere from one or two thousandths to, you know, twenty thousandths if it's a big, big part. So I guess the thicker the part, to answer your question fairly, the thicker the part, the more shrinkage you're going to get. A thinner wall part is not going to shrink as much. Is that shrinkage what allows it to release from the mold? No. No, here, I, I, let me see if I got a good picture in here. Okay. So here's a cross section of a mold. If you look back here, this is not, I, I tried to find a better picture, but I wasn't really happy with this. What this is, is that when the mold opens up here, what they have is, now you see this thing right here? This is an ejector rod. These things are typically threaded into the plate section of of the mold so that when the mold opens up as they're showing here this is going to go up this is going to hit this this piece right here and then with these springs these mold springs in here it's going to push the part off the the core or the moving half in the mold the part will fall down and then the springs will push the plate back before the mold closes to get ready for the next shot most horizontal injection molding machines have either hydraulic or nowadays they're they're going to electric servo motors to do some of this, but they actually have a cylinder that pushes it hydraulically or electrically forward and back. Because these things will the springs will eventually wear out. I've seen springs and molds snap and break and then that could cause damage to the tool or to the mold itself. So this is just a rudimentary cross section to show you how that would work. Now let me go over to this side here. Did that answer your question? Kind of, sort of? Sort of. Okay. I'm trying to keep it simple. I don't want to, 
because I have a tendency, I could get really into this, and I don't want to do that. I want because you guys are not, you know, you guys aren't molders, so I'm just trying to keep everything really simple. Yes, Scott? Do the parts have to be at least slightly ta tapered so they, they come out of the mold? Absolutely, and that's a great point, because if they're not tapered, when they go to eject off the mold, they're going to just shatter. So there is a small amount of taper on certain areas of the mold so that the parts will eject easy. That's a great point. But the reason I asked about shrinkage is because when Edison manufactured his cylinders, uh, he depended on the part shrinking so they could release it from the mold. Because you've got the grooves in there for, mm -hmm. for the cylinder. Yeah. So they had to shrink down in order to be released. Okay. I must have been his design then. That, that's just, that would never happen today with any design or anything, anything molded. So, all right, any questions? Because I'm, I'm just going to stay with this. I'm going to explain something about this guy right here. And this is the screw tip. All right, now, this is actually on a YouTube video. And if I had the Wi-Fi or wherever to get it to work on my computer, I could show this to you in, in working order. But maybe YouTube, this is, this is from YouTube, somebody would probably hammer me with something. So the screw, this is a modern screw tip here. This is a, what they call a, a check valve uh, arrangement. So you have a three-piece nozzle tip. You have this piece here. Okay, this is just the tip itself. And then you have a, what they call a ring valve. And there's usually behind here, and it's really not showing it in the picture, a seat ring. So as the material is injected in the mold, now right now the screw is back waiting for this to eject and then inject for the next part. What happens is, is that when the screw comes forward, this ring actually moves this direction here against the seat ring, and it checks all the plastic forward in place to allow it to inject in the mold without the material slipping over or slipping by it. Otherwise, you would probably have a, what they call a short. So your part would be 97% there, and they would just have like a, like a somewhat melted area because it didn't fill in all the way. So they, most molding machines use a three-piece tip here. Now, when these were made, they didn't have a three-piece tip. All they had was a plunger or something like this that was all one piece. So these plungers would actually, you know, after so many cycles, that would wear out the barrel and then they'd probably have to increase the shot, shot size a little bit, shot the, the amount of plastic you're going to put in a mold, to make up for probably short parts here. So it was just really a rude way to make parts by today's standards. And these were, this is what you ended up with. So what you see, and when you go to Cutstown or wherever you go to look for plastic radios, these look nice. But I'm sure that when they came out of the mold, they were ugly as hell because you had to clean everything up, all the flash and all the... You know, yeah, look for cracking and things like that. Because it was a very, very rudimentary way to make a plastic part. That was, that was the technology that was used in the 30s and 40s. They didn't use check valve screw tips until I think the 50s. Maybe, I don't know what year. I just, uh, I'm not that, that hip to it. Yes, Scott? Bob, the, uh, uh, the slots where the speaker sound comes out. Yeah. Most of the, well, it's a good, good question. It's a good point. If you had rib work, like, like say, this RCA right here or here, I think that's what you're referring to, yes, that could be a problem area for flash. Most of the flash usually happen on the outside. And if anything, the molders would rather have the flash on the outside because then they probably had ladies or whatever that were working on the line that would trim all that off and maybe had some sandpaper so it would just lightly go over the thing just to make it a smooth finish. Hmm. That, that Catalan radio with the handle, uh, the holes for the handle, do they have to be uh, drilled after the molding? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. No, they weren't. They were part of the mold. Okay. And when they were taken out, uh, they worked fine. This particular radio, the problem with Catalan is they shrink, they continue to shrink.
it's mounted by holes on the top of the cabinet, yes. right? And you they, need they extra pegs for the mold because it's not yes. the same. Oh, that's how they do that. The catalins are, it's different than the Bakelite in that you have lead molds, two pieces, and you pour it in as a syrupy mess. It goes into an autoclave where it's heated for a, a set amount of time, and then when it comes out, it should be set. If you don't, it's not ready to go, and that has a lot of flesh. Bakelite generally doesn't have a lot of flesh. It's very minimal, so you have very minimal pine where you have to do each cabinet. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. But well, I'm the, the, the mold is going this way, but then you have holes like at the bottom okay. to hold the chassis. To suffice, what both of you guys are saying is, now I don't know if they had the technology back then. I don't know how far back it goes. I would imagine this guy was probably made in the late 40s, maybe. What, what, what age is this radio, John? Do you know? I think it's about 1940. Okay. Oh, that's, that's pretty early. It's early. You know okay. First, you know what the first classic radio was? What? Okay. The cheapest radio manufacturers, they had the first plastic cabinet, and it was colored, and it wasn't, I don't know if it was Plascon or what it was, if you can find one today, it's worth thousands of dollars. Okay. I thought I had read something. When I was doing my research to try to put some of this together, I read somewhere it was 33, and I forgot who the manufacturer was. To get back to, excuse me, I want to answer Scott's question because it's a good one, and that is... <coughs> On the molds themselves, you can get a mold built with what's called a, they call it a core pull. Now what a core pull is, is that it's, it's usually a cylinder, air cylinder, or hydraulic cylinder. Most of them use hydraulic cylinders. And what happens is when this, now let's, I'm going to hold up John's radio carefully, and let's pretend that this handle wasn't there, this is just the molded part. What happens is within the mold itself, they have the, there was probably two hydraulic cylinders, probably, because if these didn't have to be drilled out, then that's how it got done. And after the mold was closed, these cylinders would come in and shut off it's against, against the core part of the mold. This is the, the outside of this was the cavity portion of the mold. The fat part or core part of the mold was inside. So the core pins would come in, shut that off, and then the part got molded. So that before the mold opened up, the core pins would come out or the cylinders would pull those pins out. Then the mold would open up and then get ejected. Maybe. I, I have a feeling from the looks of these, I have a, well, they may have had a fixture to drill these maybe from the looks of it. But I think that this could have been done with, with a core pull in, in, the, in the mold itself. Yeah. So you have everything in one radio. There was a number of Emerson radios that had the, this plastic handle. Even the wooden ones had this plastic handle with the two springs on it. So did that suffice or answer your question on that? Okay, good. All right. So, Neville. How is the mold, I guess it would be heated and cooled as part of the cycle, right? Yes. How do they do that? All right. They, well, that, you know what? I, and I, I neglected to talk about that, so I'm glad you brought that up. Let me go back to the other... Uh, picture here. Come on. There we go. This is probably, again, this is not the best illustration in the world, but on the side of the mold, you would have cooling lines on the side of the mold with pockets. Most of it would be on the core half because there's more steel to cool off and more area to, to, to cool down. You would have some cooling lines on this half of the mold and probably a couple on the cavity side. All right. You definitely want, I mean, when, when you're trying to get the part, when, when the mold opens up, you want that part, the actual part, to stay on the cavity half, or the, the, excuse me, the core side or moving side of the mold. So you'll find a lot more cooling lines on the moving side than you would on the cavity side. All right. And the modern molds, you know, when you start getting into like Lexans and Ultems and super engineered resins that run, as high as 750. I think there was one I was reading, 780 degrees. I forget what it was called. But 
you would actually run hot oil through the mold. I actually one I worked for a medical company for five and a half years, and they were they were a contract manufacturer of medical devices, and we were making a medical part ran in Ultem, and we were actually running heated oil through the mold to cool that part off. And it was just a tube that was this long. I forgot what the application was for, but it looked uh, looked pretty rude. I'll just let it go with that. But for stuff like this, it was probably water. The oil itself was just kind of like it had to. It was almost like it, it was had the, the the viscosity of like Crisco oil, but it was clear and it could withstand a lot of heat. And I think it was safe to be used up until we used to even have a, a unit that me and this other guy used to constantly have to take it apart once a year and replace seals on that actually heated and pumped that oil into that mold because it would get so hot it would just burn burn the seals right up and it would just start leaking oil oil over the floor and I'd hear I'd be in my office doing some work and I hear my name being paged and I'm like, oh great, I got shaft seal surgery to do on this unit. I have to take the seal off and replace it because it just got so hot. It's unbearable. So, all right. Are there any other questions, John? What year is the, the big big collector, Strummer Carlson? You know, uh, I. I think it. Yeah, I, I think it's post-war. Yeah. You know, when, when I saw I saw that at JD auction, I said I got to have that. Nobody was bidding on it. I got this at your auction for two dollars and fifty cents. Yep, I wouldn't be surprised. It was amazing, but I, I had to, I had to, I had to replace because the the dial, all the paint was peeling, and I knew about that, and that's probably why it went so cheap. So the the, the smart person I am spent thirty three dollars for the one that's in the radio, and it's not from an eleven hundred H. This was a different model radio. But it was the same part, just a different color dial. But the the numbers and everything are intact. So, you know, if you see one of these, you'll see the you'll see what I'm talking about. The paint's usually peeling and going away, and and all that. But that was kind of surgery. I had to take the whole bread slicer off and clean it all up and rewire it and all that. But I just liked the look of the radio. And Stromberg Carlson usually makes some pretty good stuff. So, all right. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, it almost looks like it had a layer line. Like it, was it, was, it was done in a German machine called a boy. Okay. You can ask Professor Mike about that because they have it in the basement. That, you know, I didn't notice about over there. They have a full machine shop over there. Yep. And I see a lot of guys that are just sitting on their butts kind of like, you know. And then when this happened, you know, I'm sure that the tool guys got together and helped this girl out. It was a girl, by the way that did this, and she was very, she was scary smart. So I had to watch my P's and Q's. Yes? Straight lines, so I thought maybe it was 3D printed. I, I know what the straight lines are. You, you, my dad used to work in plastics. Okay. And so growing up, every thing we had bought that was made of plastic, I used to get a lecture on, and this is this, and this is from the ejector pin, and this is where the, the flash, and the, but so, I, so I, listening I, to me tonight is like watching an I Love Lucy no, rerun. No, great. I, I love <laughs> um, what he's seen there, um, my father would pick on when I was a kid. He went, ah, this is sloppy work. You know, I, I'll, I'll it's say... It's the end mill line. It's the, it's the, it's the it's machining the line where that was probably, the mold was probably made on a CNC or a Bridgeport mill. And it wasn't and polished. But, well, I, and they usually are. That's where the end mill made its pass. You know, when I, when I started working for Mattel in 1970, I don't remember, 77 or 78, but everybody there was almost like a cartoon character. And that was myself included, because I had my, you know, you know me as a person and everything, but um, this was what I did for almost 30 years. And I, I you know, it, it paid for my house. It paid for a lot of things that I have now. And ironically, the last job I had before uh, I retired was I, I it was the only job I ever used my degree for and I and I worked for a, a biotech company that uh, had a drug that had a patent on it 
And you remember when COVID broke out and everybody was running around for a ventilator? Well, these comp the company that I worked for had ventilators that went out to hospitals, had the drug that we had and was dosed to patients at a ratio of drug to oxygen. And my purpose in life there was to make sure that the ventilators work properly. And I had to write reports to uh, the FDA sometimes. And it just it was a really... It was a strange job, but I loved it to death, and that was the only job I ever had that I used my electronics degree for. I actually used my electronics degree more for fixing radios than anything else, but almost 30 years in the plastic industry. So, like, like, I'll give you a quick example. One guy I worked with, he was, there was like three guys that did the die setting. That way, they, you know what that means. They take the mold in and out of injection molding machines, and they had a big roll-around A-frame or they had electric hoist to just take the mold in and out. One of the guys that did it, was a biker, and I'm trying to remember the name of the gang he was with, and he scared me to death. So I tried not to step on his toes, but one time I accidentally, they had a mold preservative that was in a can that you would spray the molds, like when, when the plant got shut down, you'd spray the molds so it wouldn't rust or anything like that, so you could sit for a day or two and then fire it up quickly after shutdown. Well, I accidentally knocked the thing over, and it went all over his leather jacket. <laughs> and one guy saw me do it. And it was an accident. I didn't do it deliberately. But that guy then was, I, I was his bitch, because I, I hate to say it like that, but he was teasing me and rubbing it. You know, I'm going to tell Billy that you spilled that all over again. I was like, okay, how much money do you want? What do you want from me? I, I, it's crazy. But everybody was like a cartoon character. Everybody had their own weird personality. But I loved it. Uh, um, my father's first job out of college was for Bakelite Corporation. And that's why I'm a Jersey boy. Oh. But otherwise, because he came all the way from Texas to work for Bakelite. Um, but um, I recently got a uh, 1980s uh, era uh, Simpson 260 meter. And I thought they were Bakelite. But this one says it's phenolic. It's probably polycarbonate. Phenolic is polycarbonate. Yeah. yeah. Or or. Uh, plastic is that? Phenolic. Yes. Is it? Yes. That, that's pretty much bakelite. It's kind of a bakelite, but it's it's kind of a cross between that and some other material. We use it a lot on airplanes. A lot of parts of phenolic. The phenolic resin. All right. One thing that's a little bit different with the phenolic resins. They have resins that have to go into material dryers before you can use it. And the reason for that is, is that if you were to mold the plastic, and if there was any degree of moisture in the plastic itself, it would show up as, as kind of like a silvery streak on the part, and that's obviously not good. So they have to put these things in material dryers, so once it's, in, once it's molded, it has that nice, nice black case finish to it. So, yes, Tom? I don't know if this is the right part of your talk to ask this question, but I just wondered if you're going to address the one plastic I've had the most problem with on radios, and that's tenite. <laughs> Where does that fit in the scheme? All right, I didn't put that in this. I read about tenite, and I didn't want to put this in here because tenite was an awful plastic on radios. Okay, it's also a thermoset. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember the history of tonight, but like some of the, the, like I'll give you an example. The Philco radios that had those push buttons that always fell apart, those were tonight. There were knobs made from tonight. There wasn't a lot of companies that used tonight for the cases themselves, but however, I think that the, the few companies that were using tonight to make parts for radios, after a while they kind of figured out, you know, maybe we should just pack up and move on. So I didn't want to really bring that up, but you're right. It's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the Philco discussions that warp, and yeah, that, that's tonight. Go ahead. For a short time, I had one of the early plastic air king, they call like a skyscraper radio. Yeah, the ones that go for big bucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. why there are so few of them around. They hadn't figured out structure, the, the structural stresses and plastic.
plastics back then mm -hmm. because it was made out of a thermoset like probably urea, whatever, or bakelite. It was white, so it was probably... There's probably plastic on. Yeah, plastic. Yeah. <clears throat> but unlike these catalan sets that have enough of their own problems, the wall thickness was thinner than if you were average. Oh, that's... Bakelite. Yeah. They didn't have a bottom on the thing, right? So there was no structural integrity there. And they supported the big field coil speaker with the plastic face of the radio. So I could see really, you know, from a structural standpoint and materials, there was not a lot of thinking about strength of materials and stresses. And it wasn't a light, it was not an ACDC set to start with. Mm -hmm. It was power transfer. So it, it, this was, uh, I could see why not many. If you set that thing down too hard, the weight of that speaker would probably collapse. The, the only time I ever saw one of those radios was in the movie about uh, what the hell was the guy? The the, the news, the big newspaper mogul. Uh, what was it? No, it wasn't Citizen Kane. It oh, was. Uh, yeah, uh, Hearst. R William Randolph Hearst did a movie. Yeah, well, it, he didn't do the movie, but they did a movie on him. And he had his girlfriend running around and became his wife and all of those. But they had one of those radios in the movie. So I don't know if that was just an actual radio or if that was just, a, I think, yeah, I, I, boy, how'd that survive? I had my hands on that and I, I saw very quickly why <clears throat> these things just don't survive. But clearly they didn't understand that plastic wasn't wood or metal yet then. Yeah. Is so. that the same as I read? I'm trying to remember the, the, the type of plastic they used, but they were adding uh, starch or something to it to help it degrade faster because a lot of uh, the plastics, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know where you guys live. I live in Middlesex County. They have a guy that picks up my recycles every two weeks. So got a big drum filled up full of, you know, glass and plastic and I'll drag it out there. Somehow I get the feeling that the glass gets recycled easily, but I think the plastic... I, I read somewhere that someone had figured out from the plastics industry, no less, that, that just slightly over 2% of all plastic does not get recycled. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Because you, you can, by using different forms of molding, you could actually exhaust that. Now, you could actually make structures and things. Like the one, co one job I had, I worked at this place for about a little over five years that did structural foam molding, and that was really, it's nothing like this. It was an extruder that went up a large transfer pipe into an accumulator, which was this huge cylinder, okay? And then you had a vertical mold like this, and the molds were probably, the smaller ones were probably the diameter, of this, well, the width of the table, and they were probably, I don't know, about two and a half foot tall, and then the bigger one, they went bigger from that. Do you know, do you, for example, um, you're driving down the road, I don't see that often anymore, but the Fitch Cratch Barriers, those big yellow bar barrels they used to fill with sand and they put a black top on it. Well, the company I worked for made them. Okay. So that mold was pretty big and you had a cavity in the core. And that was all polypropylene. And one second. And then what they would do is, in the extruder, to make the plastic into a foam, they would inject nitrogen into the plastic and then it gave it like a a bubble finish on the inside, but it also gave it rigidity and strength by doing so. So then, once, once this plastic's in this accumulator, the mold closes, and then you had this hot manifold with different valves on here, and you would take a big wrench and open and close each valve, and in the middle of the, the valve was a rod. And then you had this beam that would come up and bring all the rods up, and then the accumulator would empty out into the mold. Meanwhile, the extruder's still turning and going and all happy, close and then hold the rods down while the part cools down and then you know it, it would just the, the accumulator would just start filling up again being fed by the extruder for the next shot it was a really cool way to recycle plastic and make big parts that way yeah fred yeah i saw something where they're starting to make railroad ties out of engineered plastic yeah another good use for recycled plastics the telephone company like a lot of 
a lot of other things. They were a real early adopter of major recycling. They don't get credit for that, but they were. They had their own metal recycling. If you take apart any of the later, I say later, after about 62 uh, telephones, if you take the handset apart and the internal plastics, and I actually researched this, and I suspected it, and it was true. The, they, what they did is, you know, in the process of molding phone parts, once they went over to thermoplastics, I think it was 61 or 62, um, all the broken pieces and leftover this and all, they would recycle. And what they would dump it into the, you know, grind it up and dump it in. And, you know, you take the cup out from the back behind the, the, the mi microphone of the earpiece, it all looks like a swirl, looks like a mess of everything. Because all they did was dump the colored plastic and they just remolded it into the yeah. parts that you didn't see. Well, you, you could recycle Bakelite, but you can't put it in a, a, a very small percentage. Well, the, these, well, I were, said, these, were, these were thermoplastic. They weren't. Oh, it's a thermoplastic. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was well, the you could system. recycle Bakelite, but you can't have it go over, I think, like 10 or 12 percent or else it don't work. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cool way to do it. Well, the earliest, you're talking about the railroads. One of the earliest uses of Bakelite was they used to make insulators for the for the telegraph wires and stuff that went along the railroad and main streets and stuff like that. So, plastics has been around for a long time. Yeah, and if is bakelite, I'll call it. Is it a pure? But I know it's a mix of stuff. Is there resin and a filler, or is it just all resin? It's it's, it's, it's a bunch of different things. I, again, I'm not a polymer chemist, but I know that there's formaldehyde in it, and some other things. And uh, I'm not. Again, I don't. I don't know what else is in there. It's possible. It's possible. It looks furry when you break it. Yes. Like a cracked piece looks like a structure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I did.